Hi, it's Ray Shaleen from Pro Shaper Sheet Metal in Charlton, Massachusetts. And what you're seeing here is the first step of actually making the bonnet for an E-type nose out of aluminum. And this was the first piece we chose to make. We're using uh, my flexible shape patent method. And I've put part one, two, three, and this is going to be part four, where I refine this panel. Part one and two were covering making the flexible shape pattern, which we haven't finished yet here either, uh, but that'll be finished on a uh, later date. We're just doing the nose right, ne right the front part of the nose for, for now. And that was part one and two. Part three, we actually started working on the metal. And if you watch part three, you saw that I used my ruffling uh, arbor press uh, dies to gather the metal and then I hammer them down in my shrinking facilitator and I also did a little bit of stretching here. We annealed the front. Uh, right now the, the front's pretty stiff. It probably could stand another annealing at some point. And uh, some people will ask, well, why did you do that? Why do you do it that way, Ray? Well, uh, I try to guide my classes to what I believe is the, the largest segment of the the car collector hobby out there and I would say 95 percent of the car collector hobby uh, want to use as few as tools as possible and simple techniques to get a lot of results. Most of the hobby is restoration and uh, this craft of uh, coach building really started to catch on about 1985 or so and then with some of the TV shows and it's been revived quite, quite a bit there's a bunch of forums uh, that talk about the, this subject and there's a lot of competing information out there so there's a lot of confusion so uh, people will say again why do you do it that way well I'm trying to make it very simple now other ways that you could do it is a lot of people that have familiarized themselves with some of the processes would be to use a thumbnail die to do the shrinking here. Yes, thumbnail dies work very well. I have one, I have a Trump reciprocating uh, uh, tool over there that's a big uh, large format tool similar to a Pullmax and I have a two inch thumbnail die in it and um, I could use that and I, some of my students want to use that sometimes I let them use that and I also have a, a large scale double headed power hammer where I have a four inch uh, shrink die and that four inch shrink die would, would shrink this m much faster than what I could do in the shrinking facilitator. But the practical part of it is is that most people will not get a double headed power hammer in their one or two car garage because that's the real world situation. It just takes up too much of a footprint, makes too much noise and is just not user friendly for a, a suburban environment. So this will make noise too. No matter what you do, you're going to be making noise, but this is only in a little burst. You're going to be making the noise doing the uh, gather uh, shrinking. And so you could power hammer out this and shrink this with the thumbnail dies and that will do it. And then other people will say, well, geez, if you had an echo, you could do it faster. An Echo Old machine is a great machine. They're made in Switzerland. They're very high dollar machines. The, the tooling is very expensive. They do work very fast and, and they work excellent. But again, it's, it's cost prohibitive for most people. The footprint on one of those is a lot smaller. So it, it could be fit into a two car or one car garage situation. But the cost factor there is quite considerable. Uh, I also have a, uh, I don't have an echo, I'd like to get an echo at some day, some point so you could just have that experience here in the class. But I also have the Italian style hammer which is a maglio, which just means mallet or a hammer, it's mechanized. And I made uh, XK Jaguar pots with those for years using my, my uh, home built or shop built uh, maglio. And yes, that'll work very well too. And that it has a smaller footprint. It's nothing I think you can buy today, um, but you can easily make it. And there's smaller power hammers. There's a, a couple manufacturers of smaller power hammers, like a, a German style. I think it's a Parks 
There's a few guys on Facebook that own those and they seem to be very effective. They're much smaller footprint, but that's not something you can buy everywhere. Um, they seem to be pretty rare. And also there's a method of hammer farming. Uh, and uh, there's uh, shops around the world that will use hammer forming to make this by taking a piece of annealed aluminum and pulling it over a full hammer form that looks exactly like the E-type nose and they will hammer on it and but that is all geared towards production and what we're doing here is onesies and twosies we're not geared to production and if you go more towards the production side you could go with aircraft production techniques which would be stretcher presses or um, hydroforming presses uh, and then beyond that you've got Kirkside die uh, matches die set presses uh, and all of those are very capital intensive, enormous things and it implies that you're going to be doing a lot of volume sales. What I'm doing in this example and what I do in my class is just making a single piece. That's it. I have no intention of going into business and making E-type aluminum noses. Uh, at my age, I'm interested in exercising as much creativity as possible and I want to do a lot of stuff. Uh, I've done a lot of repetition with my XK pots in the past. Uh, I learned from doing that repetition, uh, but I'm not interested in doing any repetition now. So the first class or the first um, uh, two episodes were about gathering the information of the part, which is the flexible shape pattern. We don't, we're not using a buck, we're using the flexible shape pattern, which is probably a new, new thing to a lot of people watching this video. It's uh, something I invented and it works really, really good. And I'm going to show that. And then in part three, uh, I started the process and this is what we got and to, to get to this stage with my gathering tool and stretching here without the video being formed and explaining what you're doing it's about a half hour job so it's not a, a, a major component of uh, making this one part so where are we at, at a, after a half hour at this point here you have uh, it fitting the flexible shape pattern quite well there's about maybe a half an inch of gap here. Um, so now what we're doing in this video is we're going to refine this shape. Refining the shape is the second step in my, my class program. The first step is doing the gross development of the shape. Second step is refining the shape. And the, we won't be finishing this panel in this video. In the next video, hopefully we will, and I, that's step number three in my class, what I call adding details. And the details on this is there's a flange that gets bent over at 90 degrees here. There's another flange here. And there's a joggle here, which uh, it becomes the seat for the plexiglass headlight. So all of those things have to be done, plus we've got to roll this nose. But what we, we get concerned with now is just feedbacking off of this flexible shape pattern and we're going to look for the spot that has the most clearance and this right here needs the most amount of work so that's my target and what I'm doing is adding the area value because this is an area value tool so it's telling me where I need to add the area value it's a perfect guide so that's going to be my first target. I'm going to hit it with the mallet on a beater bag. I call that elastic stretching. And slowly but sure, this clearance will disappear and it'll get uh, much tighter. So I have a home here. I've got a perimeter mark all around. That's what I call my home. And that allows me to put it back, the flexible shape hat, and it's the same as if you were fitting to a buck you have to fit to the same spot every time otherwise you get a different reading so you have to go back to that home uh, set so that's the perimeter line all around and this panel is basically a standard compound curve with two exceptions when you, ha when you have a standard compound curve a flexible shape pattern set on a bench will have all its edges touching the bench in this case here, we can see that it doesn't have it here, 
and over here it's away from the bench. Well, there's a reverse curve right over here, and there's a reverse curve here. There's first a, a heavy shrink, but then there's going to be later a stretch that has to happen right on this edge right here. So, I have to be very aware of where those edges are as I'm working on the panel. If I see the edge come off the panel, then I've overdeveloped the panel. Right now we're in an underdeveloped stage and we want to go to full development. We're probably at um, 60 or 75 percent, somewhere in there, of development. So now we've got to add that little bit extra and bring it into the 90 percentile development. When you get it to about 90, 92 percent or so, it actually starts to look with, like you, what you want it to, do, to be. So you cannot set the arrangement of it, which is the bending of the part. Uh, until you develop all the area value. The arrangement value is secondary to the area value. So our main goal right now is just to bring this stuff up. So our goal right here is to bring this area up. So we're going to mentally make note of where that is. We're going to hammer that with the hammer. We're right in here. You can put magic marker marks on it. Um, I used to. I don't do it as much now. Don't get ahead of yourself. Always do a little check, do a little check. So areas that don't have too much crown, you can use the low crown end of the hammer. And areas that have a lot more crown, uh, you use the medium crown. The, the process of hammering this um, is basically just lifting the hammer up and then you're guiding its, its, its targeting. You're guiding it down and gravity's doing a lot of the work. The hammer's got a lot of weight to it. It does the job just by the inertia. Yeah, you do expend some energy when you're hammering this stuff out and also when you're hammering the panel will change its arrangement. It tends to uh, walk up like that. The sides will come up. So you're going to be in the process of doing this quite often, resetting the arrangement to a working arrangement. So it looks like it's a little bit high there still. So I'm going to hit it there a little more. Now I find it to be uh, a great uh, exercise program to hammer these out too. Sometimes it can be, you know, another 10-15 minutes to hammer a panel out. And uh, there's an exercise gym right down the street and I see it full all the time. People spend a lot of money to get exercise. Well, you can get exercise and make a, a Jaguar E-type aluminum nose at the same time. I think it's a pretty good bargain. So, just those few hammer blows, we've cut that clearance that we had here in half now. So we always look around on this flexible shape pattern for spots that are the worst. And it's sort of like in right here right now. So we'll tighten that up a little bit. Hammer, then check. Hammer, then check. Problems happen when you get too far ahead of yourself. And you gotta disperse the hammer blows too. If you put them all in one spot, I call that making a mushroom. There's no car panel that has a real bump in it unless it's got a carburetor under it or something, and that's kind of rare. You know, keep closing up, you have to keep opening it up. And every square inch of every panel has to be addressed somewhat. It's very little, say, out on the corners here, and a lot more generally in the center. But every square inch has to be dealt with, whether it's English wheeled or, or hammered out like this. This aluminum is very malleable, and it'll just keep moving.
Now it's better to have your hammer blows accumulate rather than hit it really super hard. If you use too sharp a point and you really wail on it like this, you'll be doing uh, a molecular damage to the panel. Sometimes it's a survivable problem, but uh, that's not a good thing to do. It's better to just do it in stages, slowly bring your panel out. Let the blows accumulate. And if you added up all the energy you're expending, knocking that panel into shape, it would be the same amount as what happens in a press in a split second. So just those few minutes of hammering or malleting, uh, it's gotten quite better now here. This is pretty tight, a little bit over in here. This isn't too bad. Go over here, that's not bad at all. So I'm within a quarter of an inch or so, the worst spot's right here. I'll give it a little, few more blows right in here. Again, it opened up on me. I closed up on me, so we gotta open it. Put that back on there. And that's much better. Now, you see this front, this is where we did the shrinks. This is laying down pretty nice. It's loose right here because that's gonna have to be stretched out. And it's loose over here, we're gonna have to stretch that out, but we'll do that later. Right now we're concerned with just getting this uh, fully inflated up into the flexible shape pad. We're tight on this back edge, we're tight on this. This is all good. Where the problems happen is when people at the class, students at the class, will hit one spot too much and then they'll have a condition such as this. I want to show you exactly what happens. So right now we've got a situation where it's fitting nicely, the edges are all touching with the exception of where this reverse is and where this reverse is. So I'm putting a piece of paper underneath here to simulate an overdevelopment. And if I went absolutely bonkers crazy and stretched that out without checking the pattern, you can see what's going to happen here. It lifts off and this is a real strong exaggeration, but I call that the tent pole. It'll, it'll just tent pole right on it like that and rotate on that high spot. So you've got to be very sensitive to how tight it's getting. The, the object is to tighten this up, but not to have it so tight that it lifts off all the surrounding uh, part of the pattern. So if that was the case, you'd have to shrink this back, which you can do with a cold shrink, you can do it with a hot shrink, or you can bring all the edges up. Both, all of those uh, solutions take a lot of time and they're very frustrating. So the best thing is not to make that mistake. So now we've got a situation where we're within a quarter of an inch. Now aluminum moves pretty fast on the English wheel or the power hammer or whatever method you're using. And um, we're going to planish this out now. And I'm reading this hammered surface, which people call walnutting or uh, a bag of walnuts. Um, and it's highs and lows. So the patent is reading the high mostly. And we're going to average it out when we run it in, the, in any type of planishing tool. It's going, the highs come down and the lows come up and uh, there'll be actually more clearance here. So we're going to wheel it and we have some shrink residue here and we're going to wheel that too. And what we want to do is get this into like a chrome plate uh, condition and to get everything all smoothed out and, and a really nice surface. In the process of doing that, we'll remove all the residue from the shrinks and sometimes you might have some elastic stretch marks if you went a little strong on your malleting. Uh, in this case here, there's none, but there are uh, shrink residues. If you'd use the thumbnail die, you would also have shrink residue, which you have to clean up. Sometimes there might be just a hint of it. It doesn't mean anything. 
uh, if there's just a hint of it. So the next step is to go into the English wheel and uh, it's pretty much a no-brainer at this point on the panel. What we're doing is we're just going to smooth this out. We're going to smooth it out and then we're going to put the flexible shape pattern on and we did only have like a quarter of an inch of clearance and we might have as much as three quarters of an inch of clearance after we smooth this out. We'll find out. All right, for this operation uh, that has a bunch of crown in it, I'm going to use what I call my medium crown uh, anvil and generally I use this one but um, I think I'll be better served by using that anvil than this one. These, this one I use probably 60% of the time. I might use it on part of the panel, but the front part of the panel, which has a lot more crown, will be using this. Now I might have to use one of my smaller wheels to get some of the detail in where that roll is, but we'll see that later on. All right, so what we're doing now is basically just a de-lumping operation, which will take about two or three, five minutes maybe. So. There's no big skill set here, it's just a matter of pushing the panel through until all the bumps go away. Now on these shrink residue area here, um, if you go this way, it's like going over a bunch of railroad tracks. It's better to go at a little bit of an angle when you negotiate through here. It'll settle them down a lot better. Now I'm losing some of my shrink when I settle these down, so I will get more gap in my panel. But we're going to raise it up a lot on the wheel too, so. Now, this is with the medium crown wheel. And basically, I, on this machine, I only use those two anvils. Rarely do I use, I've got a couple other anvils, but uh, they're very, very rare that I use them. Now, if you're an absolute beginner at English wheeling, uh, the first task you have to learn is how to negotiate through the panel. How do you get from here to over here? So it becomes a real easy procedure once you get your skill set. But beginners, it might take, they'll be kind of very tentative when they first do it. But generally, after teaching hundreds and hundreds of students, I find that it's mostly about a 10 or 15 minute learning curve. And uh, everybody, if you think about it, you overthink it and then you start making mistakes. So you just got to let your, your brain solve that problem and it does. I call it, the analogy I use is like riding a bicycle. When you ride a bike for the first time, you fall down, you don't do exactly what you, what you intended to do. But after falling down once or twice, that's probably the last time you'll fall unless you hit some obstacle that you didn't see. Um, it becomes very easy to balance that bicycle and pedal the pedals and turn and all that. It's a pretty complex task, but your brain just slowly, well actually quickly acclimates all the skill sets and uh, you don't even have to think about it. So you can see just a few minutes of wheeling here and now this panel is getting smooth. Now we get this other side over here. Now the back side of this panel was pretty flat. There's just a mild low crown to it. 
So I'm going to change the wheel out and I'll put my uh, workhorse wheel in right now. This is a nice feature of my wheel here because if you have a fender that's all together, something has a big flange, you, this is the gross uh, movement ability here with a rack and pinion. You can raise it up, allow you to get in over a flange. And I bring it down, lock it, and this is my fine adjuster here, which is in a really nice position. So now I've got my workhorse meet a uh, lower crown wheel in. I'm going to smooth out this back section here. We got the front section pretty decent. There's a little bit of residue from the shrinks, and you'll see. Sometimes you'll see on a stretch mark or a shrink mark, you'll see this white color, which is a, uh, a stress mark. And as we work this panel, that's actually off the edge. The, the perimeter is right there, so it'll be cut off anyways. But generally those marks, if you work them, uh, they will cold forge right back together again and they totally disappear. But we're first going to straighten out this back side here. Now, you use the, the English wheel also as an arranging tool. And right now it's arranged into this rounded condition. And of course the Jaguar pod isn't like that at all. And to, to ease the process of working this uh, rib section, I'm going to actually pull up on the panel like this. And I'll get that to look more like what it's supposed to and it's easier to wheel it out that way. And we're going to have a condition here that I call a loose edge. And that happens on every single panel that you do. And I'll show you how I fix that loose edge condition. So I want to settle the panel down right now. See that's a little bit of a loose edge there. It has a little bit of a wave going on. This is a little bit of a loose edge. See it's uh, alive there. It's got a spring tension to it. So as I show my students and all my classes, to solve that problem all you have to do is do a 45 action like this. Just inboard from the edge. Go one way. Go the other way. It literally takes minutes to solve that problem. So now that looseness is all gone. There's no more springiness there at all, tightened up. What we did was we wheeled inside and that caused it to equalize so that uh, the pressure is the same on both the edge and inboard. Now we got to do it over here on this back edge. Same thing, 45s. Every single panel you're going to see that on. And a lot of people will run over to a kick shrinker and kick shrink goes up, which leaves a, even if you got a stipple shrinker, it'll leave the little bit of shrinker marks. I don't really like those shrinker marks. Uh, I like the chrome, plate, the chrome plate look. I should have cleaned the wheel because we were using this wheel a lot this past weekend at the class and it could stand a little clean so I might stop and clean it so I can get a really nice finish on this panel. So we got a drum sander rubber from McMaster Car, a Harbor Freight uh, sander with a little adapter I sell in my website with a soft pad and 600 stick it paper. So you can do this by yourself this will allow you to polish your anvils and your top wheel and also uh, I have a video showing how you can use this to actually tune your anvils in and um, you can, you can uh, make them uh, closer to totally concentric. So we'll spin it up.
and just wait till it stops uh, turning. You can give it a little inspection. My lower anvils are soft. Um, they got a couple little marks in them. It would probably take me about 10 minutes to sand those out, five minutes maybe. But they're not affecting the panel right now. They're just really minor. Uh, my top wheel, uh, generally when you're using it on aluminum, uh, the aluminum will f uh, flake off a little bit and you'll get little bits of, of uh, aluminum sticking to the top wheel. So you got to please it constantly to make sure you don't have any of that uh, sticking on. All right, so I'm finished sanding it, polishing it, and there's no foreign material on it. It looks pretty good, so I'm good to go. So now I have the edges pretty much settled down. I could use a little bit more on the front nose here, and um, I haven't put the flexible shape pattern on it, and I'm looking for surface anomalies. I want to see what my surfaces are doing. I know that the surfaces want to be perfect when it's done. Even in the middle stage here, I don't want any real strong anomalies. So I'm seeing a trough here and a trough here as I dance the light on it like this. So in this situation, I will put the center of the wheel right where those low spots are. And you can wheel that low spot and it'll come up real fast so monitor it and then just bring that up I get another one right here as you can see the panel is starting to shine nice it's in this curl arrangement right at this moment what it looks like, the arrangement doesn't mean anything at this point. What we want to do is just smooth it all out. So we're going to get to a condition where we have a lot of area change, but not 100% yet. And we want it smooth. So this is rolling really nice and smooth through here. And I don't know if I can get down here unless I change the arrangement radical because I might get a, a, a bite on the edge of the wheel. But we might change the arrangement. I can go in over here and settle this little tab out here. And I'm wheeling in an efficient manner, wheeling the long stroke here. And I'm not doing uh, tracking patterns at all. Generally, I don't do tracking patterns till later on in, in the panel. But the development of the panel, I don't do it that way. That would be uh, if you were doing it like if you were trained in England to do it, you would be very concerned about tracking patterns. I'm always concerned about surface quality. So, as I spoke earlier, I don't know if the camera can see it, but there are a little bit of light areas here. These are stretch marks that as we wheel it, we're going to be doing compression stretching before we were doing elastic stretching with the, the beater bag and the mallet. Now we're going to be doing compression stretching and these will, what I call coal forge heel, back together again. They will totally uh, disappear and there'll be no difference than where we malleted versus a spot that we didn't mallet it. So let's see what the flexible shape pattern says at this point. We've got the panel stabilized. All the, ma the residue from the malleting is gone and we'll put the flexible shape pattern. We might have a half an inch of gap or more. Well, I won't know until we put it on. 
So we put it on. Well, it's better than I thought. Uh, over here, it's fitting pretty nicely. Here we've got some uh, gap here, but it's only maybe a, almost a quarter of an inch right in here, less over in here, and almost nothing here. So we always go to the worst spot first, and we're going to go in here. So we're going to make sure I get my perimeter marks on here. So the magic marker uh, fades out when you wheel it. So we're going to get the perimeter marks again on the panel. Make sure we're on the spot. That's that. All right, so we tried the patten, and most of the clearance is right up here. That's where it makes the, the most turn, right in here. That's where it needs all the area. And generally, you're going to get the most area change where there's a lot of radius. Here, it's two real mild low crown radiuses, and here, you're not going to get much here. Right here, you got a strong radius right here. That's where you're going to get the area has to be changed. So I'm going to go back to my other anvil, the one with the little higher crown to it, and that'll pop this up a lot faster. Now when you go into the wheel, you see a lot of people spinning the wheel and doing this. It, I don't really like that, especially if you have soft anvils. Uh, it can put a little uh, mark on your anvil. And it's not that safe because it drags you in. It's better to go in at a 45 degree angle, take advantage of the relief on the edge. And it's good to have strong reliefs on the edges because then they'll stop your wheel biting, the bottom edge of wheel biting. So I got a pretty good pressure on this right now. We're in the high to medium pressure zone and it'll pop this up pretty fast. Here's the residue of the shrinks. That's settling that down a little bit more. And going at it with a 45 degree angle or so. So we'll wheel for a few minutes at this pressure with this wheel and then check to see what we've got. That came up pretty quick. I'm not going to go any more there. I'll turn it around and I'll get this other side here. loosen it up now. I notice on, I have one red handle here. Uh, that gives me an idea of where I'm at. So if I want to come back to the same spot, I get to get that red uh, knob right at the same spot. So I'm going to re release it here, pull out, and then we'll check this with the flexible shape pad. So we wheeled for just a couple minutes, and then we check. So we had a good quarter of an inch here. And now it's getting pretty close. That little bit in that corner there, it's closer right in here. I don't need too much of anything in here. So that's like, I call it no-fly zone now. I need some in here. So I got a little bit in this corner, a little bit in that corner. Stay away from right here for now. Now, 
I've been concentrating my effort on the front half. I'm going to have to take the other wheel and finish this off after I get this stuff up to uh, where it needs to go. So a little bit in here and a little bit in here and then we'll check again. I'll bring that knob right around. That's where it was. Same pressure now. Release the pressure a little bit. Now I'll go over on this corner here. check it again. It's in a curl arrangement right now. It's favorable to work it that way. And still a little loose right in here, so it's going to need more there. And it's looser right in here. So we're going to get inboard here a little bit. Aluminum does pop a lot faster than steel does, so you got to be careful. You got to sneak up on it. We got real. I'm in the high pressure zone, which means I'm moving the metal pretty fast now. Get this little section over here now. I've even tightened it more. And we'll loosen her up. I'm going to blend it in a little bit over here. Check it again. So now we have a condition where over on this side here, it's really nice and tight now. It's a little bit loose here because we were concentrating over here. I'm going to change the wheel out to finish this part because I don't need that higher crown wheel to do this. Um, Then over here, I still got a little bit right there. I got to add some right in there. So I'm going to leave that wheel in for now until I get that up. So that's my main target area right there. So it tells me exactly where I need to go. Now I can imagine if you were fitting this to a wood buck or any type of, of a buck of wire form, you would have to put it back in arrangement because it doesn't look anything like the part, barely resembles the part that we're trying to make here. But we can do all this work with the part out of arrangement and know that we're right on the money as far as what the, is called for to make the correct area value. Because that's what you're doing when you're shaping metal, is you're creating the correct area value. 
Once you have the correct area value, then you can set the arrangement value. And not until you have the area value 100% though. It's got to be right on the money. It will resist. It won't bend. A set and arrangement is all about bending the metal. This is all about shrinking and stretching the metal. The area value. The arrangement value is bending. So we're working on that one spot. Now if we go too much, we just release it by working adjacent to it. We go crazy too much, then we have to shrink. I'm trying to do this relatively quickly. Okay, so that came up pretty nice. This is the transition zone over here where it goes from the higher crown to the lower crown area. I'll probably go in there just a little bit with that higher crown wheel and then we'll switch out to the lower crown workhorse wheel. So a few more minutes here. And the goal of this video is to get it up to the very close to the correct area value and then I'll pop it in arrangement It'll look like the Jaguar pot, but we won't be able to finish uh, all the features, which is be the adding the flanges and the joggle and, the, and setting the roll exactly correct right on the front. Um, that's going to be in the next pot five video. So there I did some transitioning there. And now we'll see what we got. Okay. I might have gone a little bit strong right in here. It's a little super tight and it's getting a little loose there, but it's a very minor problem. I won't worry about that right now. So I think now. I should do a little bit more right here. Let me get a little bit more right there. And then we're going to change the wheel out. Now what I'm going to do now is I filled that up. I'm just going to lighten the pressure and kind of equalize everything here. So this would be equivalent to patent wheeling where you're kind of blending it softly all together here. And I'm using this higher crown wheel. I'll follow up with the lower crown wheel in a minute. You can see it's naturally just turned into what I call the barrel. Uh, it tends to do this. Now, if I look down here, I do have a bunch of furrows, uh, low spots. I can take those out first here. Just a couple strokes through each one of these will get them out. Remember, you're always working at the center of the anvil. That's where the contact area is. That's where the work is happening. Okay. 
A lot of people wonder why do I have these wide wheels? Well, your answer to that question would be you got to try the wide wheels and you would know why I have the wide wheels. I find them vastly superior to the standard widths that are considered to be traditional. I do have some narrow wheels which I use very little but they're nice to have every once in a while. Most of the time I'm using the wide wheels. Okay, so we've got that like that. Let's double check the patent. Remember the beauty of this is it reads whatever you got in any arrangement you have. So I have this curl arrangement right now which is the favorable arrangement to work the panel. I still got a little low right there so I'm going to chase that right there. Everything else is looking really really good, nice and tight. You have to pull it really tight to, to get the assessment. There's the spot here where it needs more. That would be the equivalent of this spot right here. So, so we're going to go right where that spot is. I'm going to pump up the pressure a little bit. Release the pressure. And then we will check it again. See if we made, made progress on that. Okay, we did make some progress, but there's just a hint of it still right there. And you can take sometimes just take your finger like that and mark it. I won't even put the gloves on now. Pump this up a little bit. Now that tightened up very nicely. So now what we have is just some surface anomalies. Our area value is almost there. We're in a really tight curl which is very favorable to the other wheel. The other wheel should negotiate through there. So we're going to pop the other wheel in now. That higher crown wheel that had about a uh, quarter inch to five sixteenths contact area. This one has like a seven sixteenths inch wide contact area. Now we might be able to negotiate all the way through right to the front with this wheel because we're in such a nice tight curl here out of arrangement and it'll allow us to settle this down really nicely. So what we feel for now with these little vibrations, we can feel it and we'll wheel it until those vibrations go away. Those are the little surface anomalies feedbacking to us.
So you can see the finish is getting pretty nice here. This is the front edge. We still have our perimeter marks. And we try this on here. We're laying down nice here. There's no looseness on this edge. There's no looseness on the back edge. And we just have this looseness where the joggle is and that's to be expected. Um, there is a, still a little bit of looseness right here. I'm going to try to pump that up with that wheel again right there. And then we have the required little bit of reverse that we have to do here. We're going to chop a lot of that metal off before we do that reverse and make it a lot easier to, to stretch that out. So let me address this. That's that spot right there. Sometimes you have enough abrasive in your hand to, without having to use a magic marker, you can put a little circle spot on it and that'll identify the spot really nicely. So I'm gonna pump that area just a little bit more. So I'm really close to the correct area value except for this one little spot. And then the next issue will be surface quality. There are some slight waves in there or low spots and we'll go after those. They're very minor. And then after we get that done, then we will set the arrangement. And lastly would be doing that stretch on this edge and this edge to allow those reverses. All right, it's a little bit loose right in here. That would have been the transition area era. And one of the great tools that you have is being able to have a white background or a lighter background and doing a horizon view of your panel here. And you get really tuned to horizon views as I look at it right here, there's a little low right here, which meant that I put a lot of my emphasis first on this front section and I didn't do too much up in here. So this needs a little pumping up right here. It's a little bit low. I got to do that with this wheel and this wheel is perfect for it too. So I'm going to pump that section up a little bit. Now sometimes on the flexible shape pattern is a residue of the um, plaster of Paris that we use to kill the sticky. So make sure you dust your panel good and you won't have that. So after we get the surface quality a little better, then we're going to start setting the arrangement. So surface quality, you have the horizon tool and you have the reflection tool. So you, you let the light dance on the panel and it shows you all the little highs and lows and you just chase them out one at a time. Now this is very different than say a traditional uh, English wheeling which would be all patent wheeling. I just chase the highs and lows and filled my flexible shape pattern out. It's a totally different method. All that matters is you get a good result. As you can see, this will come out really nice. You might not be convinced at this point, but believe me, it'll come out beautiful. I'm going to lower the pressure a little bit. Because it's in such a curl, it's, it's fouling with the wheel a little bit. So I'm going to take and open it up a little bit. Now as I open it up, you'll see it'll start looking more and more like that Jaguar panel that we're trying to make here. So now I've opened it up and we'll take the reading at this point and see what it says. 
You want to hold it nice and tight. That's all really nice and tight right there. Tight there, beautiful. And the edge is nice and tight on the back and the, in the center. Just loose there, which it's supposed to be. So we're looking pretty good. So as far as the area value, we're just about there. And now we're looking at surface quality. So now I can wheel it a little easier. It's not a tight arrangement. Look for the little anomalies and chase those out. The pressure is lower. I'm not going to have too much effect on the area value right now. A little something on the wheel here. You constantly got to police the wheel. Um, little bits of foreign matter from your gloves, your beard, a bug, whatever, can get caught on the wheel and it'll print itself on the panel. So you got to keep constantly vigilant for foreign material. And then these, the very end of the panel, which is going to be cut off anyways, probably because we've got about an inch extra here. We're going to give it a little attention here going this way. see a low spot right here now I'm going to loosen the pressure a little bit and blend this all together really nice. Now at all times you have total control over the process. You're going from a condition of underdeveloped to a condition of fully developed. If you're underdeveloped that just means that you've got uh, some more work to do pumping it up to where it's supposed to be the correct area value. Uh, if you're overdeveloped meant that you were a little too zealous and then you have to make corrections. So if you made a small mistake all you have to do is work around where you're overdeveloped and it'll bring the surrounding territory up to the level of the overdeveloped area and it'll all come out just like it never happened and it'll fix itself essentially. But that can be a sidetrack that can spend an hour or two sometimes straightening it out. So something you want to avoid. You know, avoid it by constantly feedbacking off of both either the buck or the flexible shape pattern depending on what method you're using to make the panel. Now in the case if you're using a buck this panel here is out of arrangement. Every time you went over to the buck to get the buck's reading, you would have to put it back in arrangement and that becomes a tedious job. That's what the beauty of the flexible shape pattern. But you need a full surface to make a flexible shape pattern work. You can't make a, an original design. You can make half of it and then make the other side by f flipping it inside out because you get to make both sides from the same flexible shape pattern. So all we're doing here is just enhancing that surface quality, constantly looking for any little flaws. 
and there'll always be flaws no matter how good you get there'll be minor flaws but it gives you that nice buffed look it's one of the things I like about the English wheel if you use an Eckhold it's going to be all stipple marks all over the entire panel if you use a uh, power hammer you have to use oil on it and you constantly have to keep cleaning the oil off it gets all over your clothes or if you're using a uh, leather vest it's going to get all over that work work vest this is relatively clean noise free So that's looking pretty good. Now we'll start to set the arrangement on it. We'll double check to make sure we didn't go overboard here. We put this on and it's fitting about as good as it can get. That's fitting pretty nicely. Well, there might be still, yep, there is still a spot right there. It's a little weak right there and that's been a, a problem area now I don't think I can get that with this wheel so I'm going to go back to the other wheel and just give it a little more right there so now I'm putting this wheel in I can use this wheel to pump up that one spot that needs it and also I can use this for the edge stretching that it needs this would be perfect for the edge stretching so let me locate that area again and it's right in here I mark it with my finger, get it in there. Take that out. And that's a lot better that's what I want to see really nice and tight there now so that did the trick so what I want to do now is using that wheel is do this little bit of edge stretch here and a little bit of edge stretch over here on this one this is the actual cutoff point here so I'm going to mark it with blue tape and I'm going to cut that extra material off right now So now I've marked my uh, excess material with this blue tape. You can snap beautiful lines with that blue tape. I use it all the time to do cutting. And I'll get my cordless shear and we'll cut that little excess off here. tape off and now you can see with a close-up there's where the shrinks were the magic marker my lines are still there there's no evidence of those shrinks at all they completely disappeared the uh, malleting marks the little stretch marks they've completely disappeared so you always have to leave yourself a little bit of room for cleanup and that cleaned up really nice so now we're going to just do a little edge stretching here and we can do that with the mallet you put it over the edge of the bag or you can do it all with the wheel I'm going to try to do it on the bag here so I got a, a bag protector I call that the sacrificial layer and we're going to stretch this let me double check always make sure that you're 100% sure that what you're going to do 
All right, so we need to stretch from here all the way to here. And on edge stretching, that's a, a linear stretch essentially. You've got to hit with the hammer at this angle. You don't want to hit inboard here. You want to hit right on the edge, stretching that edge. And it wasn't so much over here. So now we've done a little, and then we're going to check it with this. And we're almost there. And we got to do a little bit over here too. More up here, less here. What we're looking for is that to sit right down. So that's extra, that's uh, actually where the joggle is going to be, but it has to come in board all the way to here. So I got to keep stretching that more. Now, when you hammer on the edge, you're changing the arrangement, you're just bending it over. But you also want to pull the metal apart, basically. You want the metal to stretch. So you got to kind of give it a good slap there. And we're going to follow up with the wheel. And that's not a kneel during so that's pretty stiff, so. But that doesn't matter, we'll get it over. See, now that's about right there now. And this one's pretty close too. But I don't want this uh, causing a problem with me setting the arrangement, it could. So I'm not gonna do any more. Well, maybe just smooth that out. Let me smooth this out now. So in this case here, I want to wheel this upside down like this. We'll just give a light smoothing right now. little light smoothing here. There. Now we're going to attempt to set the arrangement. And that involves changing the curl, which was this way, we're going to change it to this way now. The, this big beater bag really facilitates this nice soft surface so you can walk that over. Because the area value is correct now for this positioning, now it will take the desired area or arrangement value that we want. So you can see that's almost touching over there now. That's looking pretty good. This is looking good here. So I'm pulling that front over. This is diving down over here. So I'll show you how you can use the wheel to fix that. So what we're gonna do for that is we're gonna lift it up like this. And we'll straighten this section out.
and then this here is a little out of whack so we'll straighten this one out Try the flexible tray pattern and see what we got. Looking pretty good here. That's not a problem. We might be a little bit overdeveloped in here because this is a little loose. So I'm going to wheel that back edge a little bit to settle that down. I stretch that edge out and I work my way in board. And then verify it. It's looking pretty good, maybe still a little bit right here. This is all nice and tight. This, of course, has to come around quite a bit more. Let's give that a little bit more pull down. have here. Uh, this is going to be the flange and it's still a ton of extra material so it's kind of corrupting the shape a little bit. But as you can see it's getting really close right now. This has to go a little bit like this. And all that's going to be detailed out to the to perfection with the gauges. We're not going to address that in this video, but we're getting really close to as far as we want to go with this video. Um, the next video is going to be dealing with setting the arrangement to 100%. We've got the area value where we want to be. The panel is showing really nice and the next step is a little bit of detail work over here and setting this arrangement. We made the uh, arrangement tool earlier, uh, but we might not even have to use that. I'll try not using it. That's to hammer form that arrangement on the front, but I'll, I'll show that you don't really absolutely need that. But that's about it for part four, which addressed the bringing the area value up and the surface quality. The surface quality is really nice. There's still a few little small spots that are got to be picked up. Our flexible shape pattern is telling us we've done our job. We've got to stretch this edge out still a little bit more here and we've got some trimming to do and we have to start making these flange areas. That's kind of holding us up, all this material right here. Th that's what we'll be doing in part five of making the aluminum bonnet for the E-Type. Well, it's Ray Shaleen. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please uh, subscribe, like, and make comments. See you on part five. Thank you.